Hello everybody, this is Early Medieval Embroidery and I'm Alexandra Makin. Today we're going to look at a stitch that has a number of different names. It's sometimes called laid and couch work, but a lot of you may know it as a Bayer stitch. So what I'll do is run through what we know of this particular stitch and then I will give you a short example of how it was worked, particularly on the Bayer tapestry. So Bayer stitch is a bit of a mysterious stitch. Um, obviously, most people know it from the Bayer tapestry uh, where it's been used throughout the whole of the wall hanging um, to define um, filled in areas on figures, horses, um, animals on the borders, buildings, ships, um, trees, you name it, it probably uses this stitch. It's a very economical stitch to use. There's very little thread on the back, um, it's all on the front, and it's very quick to work. And so you can understand why it was used on the Bayer tapestry. Also, it's worked in wool on linen, um, in this particular instance, and we see that other surviving examples um, from the period, of which there's really only one, um, also work it wool on a linen ground fabric. So the earliest surviving example of laid and couch stitch is the Bayer tapestry. But you can tell that this stitch must have been around for a while because when you look at it in detail on the wall hanging, you can see that the embroiderers were experts in producing it. They weren't um, learning and improving the stitches they were going along. You can see that um, right from the beginning, um, it's been worked with um, up to a very high professional standard. However, we have no other um, examples surviving from prior to the Bear Tapestry, which we think was made in around about 1070 CE. But we have documentary evidence, particularly from early medieval England, that discuss wall hangings being made for um, houses, presumably, um, and they were often gifted to um, ecclesiastical institutions. Um, there's a famous example of the Brignoth wall hanging. Um, when Earl Brignoth uh, died in his fight against the Vikings in around about 997, um, his wife, his widow, um, gave to the monastic community at Ely a wall hanging that was either woven or embroidered with these great deeds of her husband. If this was um, an embroidered wall hanging. We can imagine that it was something like the Bayer tapestry, showing these huge de um, battle deeds and scenes, um, and it would have been worked in po probably wool on a linen ground fabric. Wool is really good um, thread fibre for um, filling in large areas and giving impact, which you can see on the Bayer tapestry. So we have some documentary evidence that might link up with this stitch um, but as I said um, the Bayer tapestry is the earliest surviving um, piece to show this stitch being used. There's another really interesting example from um, a church in a place called Rue in Norway where a fragment was found and you can see this here um, and it shows um, a part of a horse and um, some foliage and about seven um, figures. Um, and then you've got, you've got a, a folate border along the bottom surviving. And this has been worked in a laid and cow stitch as well. Very similar to um, the Bayer tapestry. This dates to the 12th century. So this is, I suppose, the next earliest surviving piece that we know of that uses this particular stitch. And obviously this is linking that stitch and those, the use of the wool and the linen to um, the Scandinavian world. Um, linking into that whole Scandinavian world, you then have um, some really interesting examples from um, 
in Iceland. These date to um, later in the period, we're talking here about um, from 1550 onwards, but again you can see that they're using um, the same stitch to portray um, sit different scenes. Um, in, in this instance, um, they are a religious scenes, but on a larger scale with these folate, folate borders for people who, to look at them from a distance. So it's very useful stitch in that sense. Then the stitch um, is called refill embroidery in Iceland. Uh, refill sumo, excuse me if my pronunciation's <laughs> out, um, but you, there are a number of surviving examples from Iceland um, that show that um, the Icelandic embroiderers were, were also really skilled in using the stitch. Um, and this particular um, example is from traditional Icelandic embroidery um, and I've put the details for this down in the um, comment section below. So these are, as far as I'm aware, the only examples of the stitch worked in wool on a linen fabric. Um, now at this point, I should have said we actually have two surviving examples of um, laid and cow stitch from the early medieval period, not the one. So we have the bear tapestry, which I'm going to continue talking about in a bit, but we also have a piece dating to around the same period between um, 1060 and 1090 CE. And this piece is really interesting because it's actually worked in silk. Um, it was found in the tomb of Bishop William de Calais. He was the Bishop of Durham Cathedral um, after the Norman conquest of England. And you can see from the image that it looks like um, a silk floss um, that has been laid down and then it's been couched over the top in the same manner as um, the wool on linen from the Bayer tapestry. But obviously this is a lot finer and this is actually um, the first example of this stitch being used in silk, which you see in later pieces through um, Opus Anglicanum and moving on through to um, the Italian stitch, which I've also mentioned as well. As we move through to um, the later period, later medieval period, um, particularly in England, but also on the continent, you have examples of um, laden couch work worked in silk. Um, there's a famous example of a small section, which you can see here from the St. Clair Cheshire Ball, and you can see that it's it's been beautifully worked, uh, really fine, and the precision um, it's it harks to the rest of the Opus Anglicanum um, tradition, um, as you can see. Um, Grace Christie in her famous book, I know in other vlogs I've been mentioning her book, English uh, Medieval Embroidery, talks about um, laden couch work being used for, um, particularly for religious embroideries, um, and she discusses how it was um, worked. Um, it's worked in exactly the same way as um, it had been for the Bear Tapestry. So, this is a really interesting um, view of this particular stitch because it's showing you its evolution um, through the changes in fibres that um, are used to create it and those um, fashions and tastes change um, therefore the stitch stays but the fibres and the colours that perhaps that it's um, worked in change. Um, so that's a really interesting um, point that I think um, could do with some more research, particularly for this stitch, but across embroidery generally. We also have, um, this is an excellent book, um, which I'll put the link to below, The Art of Embroidery. Um, and um, again, in here, the authors talk about laid and couched work 
and they um, link it to um, again the Bayer tapestry but another a number of um, later embroideries particularly those um, linked to ecclesiastical um, vestments and um, again worked in silk so you can see that evolution um, continuing you find then that um, in Italy in the 17th century um, this stitch is known as Italian stitch and th this is used um, for again ecclesiastical vestments and it uses floss silks um, and again it's worked in the same way as previously and Dr Jessica Grimm has actually um, written a blog about that so I'll put the link to that um, in the comment section below as well so you can follow that up if you want to. So obviously we know it um, from the early medieval period as being um, worked on the Bayer tapestry and um, this um, huge hanging just over 68 metres in length um, although there is um, a section missing from the end um, uses a ground fabric of linen thread and um, the, um, the wool that was used for the embroidery is a two-ply S-twisted wool thread um, and it's worked in quite a uh, restricted number of colours um, including um, pink slash um, orangey red, um, brown violet, um, red, a mustard yellow, a beige, a blue black, a dark blue, a mid blue, a dark green, a mid green and a light green. So you can see that um, the colours are quite restricted, um, often being tonally quite um, complementing each other and they run through certain shades like the greens do. But the effect that is created by combining those colours and using this particular stitch is quite dramatic. Um, when you look particularly at the battle scenes and the horses charging um, and um, sails on the ships being uh, with the wind um, thrusting them out and pushing the um, ships forward. So there, and that is, those dramatic scenes are created by using different combinations of colours within um, one section. So if you look at the horses in detail, you'll often find that one leg is a different colour to others. Um, and there's a lot of debate and research about whether that's being done on purpose or um, it was just about thread that was um, to hand at the time. Um, and then you also, uh, as, um, as you can see, I've not drawn any conclusions from that yet. Um, but you also see on the horses in particular, that different parts of the horses um, are using Bayer stitch at different angles, it's wet at different angles, and you can see this in um, the image that's here now. And by working the stitch at slightly different angles, the um, it gives a dynamism, um, a dynamic movement to the horses in particular and shows off those muscles um, particularly of the horses legs moving and of their chests and, and around the cheeks so this stitch is actually quite um, can be worked quite elaborately in order to create these different effects and um, this can also be seen on um, the clothes of a particularly um, the ecclesiastics and um, the people within the different courts um, where sometimes you have um, the use of different colours to emphasise folds in clothes or perhaps if someone's sat down they um, it shows that they've got their legs um, bent as they sit on a seat or a bench um, and sometimes they the swoosh of um, the garments are shown through that change of stitch direction as well. So the embroiderers who were working the Bayer tapestry were um, really expert in using this stitch, both technically but also to um, 
show to the viewer what was happening, the action that was happening in the, the narrative um, that runs across, across the middle register of the Bear Tapestry. You also see um, similar effects on some of the animals that are worked in the borders and again this often echoes what's happening in the main narrative, not always but sometimes you can. Um, it sometimes um, shows a, a di dynam dynamism, I can't say that word, <laughs> um, between different creatures in the borders or um, it's um, it's showing that perhaps there's a wing, one wing behind another wing um, and this sort of thing. So it's not just about working with stitch, it's actually thinking through the process of um, what are we trying to say in these particular scenes, how can we emphasise that through embroidery? Oh, I think that's really exciting and interesting um, and something that needs more research um, undertaking, so maybe in the future. So now I'm going to show you how um, the stitch was worked um, on the Bayer tapestry. So the stitching on the Bayer tapestry, on the original bits, not the restoration, always starts with a knot. The outlines are nearly always worked first, although there are some instances where um, they're worked after the filling. Um, but the majority of the time you do see that the outlines are worked first and then the filling is completed. Um, on this sample though, I've left the outlines off so that you can see the working process more clearly. So you can see here that I'm working from the centre of the circle out to the right and then I'll go back to the centre and work out to the left. Um, on the areas that I've analysed on the bear tapestry so far, uh, there's no evidence for the embroiderers working from the centre out. But I do this um, because it keeps the angle of the stitches correct across the whole motif. I found that if I work from one side to the other, um, the, my angles start to skew. You can see that the stitches are placed very close together and the next stitch always pushes the previous one closer to its neighbour, um, thus hiding the ground fabric nicely. Oh yes, um, and I should say, people have asked for these videos to be shown in real time, so I've not sped this one up at all. So you can see that I'm casting off this first thread with two small stitches, uh, but on the bare tapestry, threads were passed under previously worked stitches, and this is on the reverse, or they were brought up further along the work and then caught under stitches as they were worked later. You sometimes find that um, threads were left hanging as well, um, although that's not found consistently across the um, tapestry. Sorry, I was just thinking about that last bit then. So I'm using 40 centimetre lengths of thread um, to, because I found that these hold um, their integrity across the working length, um, but after that it does start to give. You can see that uh, because most of the thread is at the front of the embroidery, it covers large areas and quickly. Um, and obviously in this stitch, the base layer covers um, the ground fabric completely.
So now I'm getting to the edge of the motif and you can see I'm having to push the thread slightly so I can see the outline of the motif itself. Um, you always add that one more stitch because when the overlying stitches are added and um, the base layer can sometimes be pushed inwards slightly which reveals a bit of the ground fabric. Um, so I always add an extra stitch just to be on the safe side. So starting a new thread to um, work the next side. The outlines um, are good for hiding those slight inconsistencies that you can see around the edges. Um, but I thought you would want to see um, the edges as they're being worked. So you can see that although the stitches are being pulled um, tight, they're not being pulled too taut um, because you want the um, thread to not look thin. You want it to sit nicely on the ground fabric. And you can see that if a um, stitch doesn't sit right, it's easy to um, take it out and rework it. Because most of the thread is on the front of the fabric, um, it's quite an economical stitch to use. And so you can imagine, as I was saying earlier, that um, this stitch was used quite a lot for large wall hangings um, where you wanted the stitches to be worked quickly, but also you didn't want to waste a lot of thread on the back of um, the piece that you were making. Okay, so just finishing off that thread and I'm about to start the final one for the base layer. And again, I'm just pushing the previously worked stitches over so I can see the edge of the design and I'm just slotting those couple of extra stitches in. So now, for the second layer of stitching and again I'm starting in the middle so that the stitches um, all remain straight and don't get squiffy the closer to the outer edges I work um, and as I said before there's 
um, no evidence on the areas that I've worked, analysed so far to show that um, the embroiderers did this um, on the Bayer Tapestry. You can see that the placement of each stitch on this layer um, should be equidistant. Um, and on the bare tapestry, the placement um, of these stitches um, is different from uh, motif to motif. Sometimes that depends on its size, I think, but also probably uh, from worker to worker, although this um, needs more research. Um, but I think that would be a very interesting area to look into. You can also see that this layer of stitching is worked at right angles to the first layer. And already we can see that um, texture and definition um, developing as well as the structure of the stitch. And this um, layer also uses very little thread and is quick to work. However, you do have to ensure that the thread isn't pulled too tight uh, because it can lead to them looking thin um, and it, that can also pull the um, base layer of threads out of place as well. And you do find on the bare tapestry that some of the um, second layer of stitches are worked quite close to um, the edge of each motif um, as I've worked on this um, piece here. So now I'm just prepping the thread for the third and final layer. So this layer is formed of holding stitches and these, as you can see, are worked in the same direction as the base layer and they're small stitches that lie over the top of um, the second layer of threads at regular intervals. Um, and these intervals are um, alternate on each row and they form a brick-like um, pattern which you'll see in a minute. Oh, I was having a bit of trouble with the thread there. Okay, we're back up and running. Okay, so starting um, the holding stitches on um, the second row. And as you can see, or you will be able to see, um, I'm lining them up so that they lie um, in between the holding stitches um, on the row above forming that brick-like effect. So they hold the whole stitch in place and again they're adding more definition and texture um, which we looked at um, particularly when we were talking about the horses earlier in this video.
with these holding stitches in particular you have to be really careful not to pull um, that second layer of threads out of alignment or make the holding stitch too tight um, as this can pull all the threads um, out of sync as well You can see that now the pattern's established and I'm working my way down the motif that um, I've got a working with them um, going and that actually this bit is also quite quick to work and you, again it uses very little thread. You can see that on that fourth row down, and I didn't realise this at the time, that um, I misplaced some of the holding stitches. So it's pulled that second um, layer of thread slightly out of line, which is a bit annoying. But you do see that on the bare tapestry as well. So I'm in good company. Now just working that last row. And there's the finished motif. Also thought you might like to see the reverse of the embroidery and you can see how little thread has been used on the back 
Um, and this is the type of thread pattern you'll see on the reverse of the bed tapestry. So I know I've worked it right. Well, I hope you found that interesting and useful. Um, as always, thank you so much for watching. If you've got any questions or comments, pop them in the um, comment section and I will answer them as best I can or point you in the direction of um, answers. Um, if you liked this uh, vlog, then please uh, tick like so that I know that I'm still doing things right. Um, and if you would like to know when um, new vlogs come out, then um, please um, subscribe to the channel and then you'll know immediately when um, I post the next one. So thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye!